I thank you so much for this evening. I thank you for this day. But I, I thank you for the rhema word. I thank you that every believer has that option, has that available, a rhema word from you. Thank you that you'll never leave us or forsake us. And I just, I pray, my, my prayer is to you, if it's even reasonable for me to ask this, Lord, to give me wisdom to be able to preach and teach and my mouth to be able to articulate the words that this message can go forth, cause no offense, but just liberty, just freedom, and just a blessing to all those who call you upon your name. Amen. So, uh, good morning everyone out there. Uh, for you guys on here, if you go to my Facebook page, uh, I Believe God Ministries or John Robinson, you can see these notes which I've already posted. Uh, otherwise, you could, after you watch this video, you could email me your address and I will be happy to send you my study notes um, as you guys ever everybody always kind of knows I like teaching more than say preaching um, so I use my notes pretty heavy and they're we spend a lot of time on them just to try to make sure they're correct grammatically correct and saying what they mean because I know that, like on Facebook and YouTube, these things will come on a year later, two years later, and without a uh, reference to me speaking, you just really don't know. So bear with me. Um, I can't preach without notes, but I, I want to use them. So I've labeled the, today's message, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I know most of us are very common, nor forsake you. Um, and we're, com we're, we're familiar with this passage. We find it along with many other places in the Bible. But in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 is my reference for today. Bibles very fast until it comes time to preach to teach okay Hebrews 11 uh, chapter 13 verse 5 says this let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have for he has said I will never leave thee nor forsake thee now context is everything and we're not uh, warmongers and murderers God's going to judge but we're to be content with everything we're not to be covetous to what our neighbors have how about people that just seem to really be following the devil are, are just their own flesh and everything goes right for them they have a retirement they have a house everything just goes right for them uh, the Bible, this is the context right here. Don't be uh, 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 covetous. Don't let your lifestyle, your conversation, your lifestyle be covetous. And uh, be content with such things as you have. That, my friends, that does not mean if you got an old broken down car that spends more time in the shop or more money that you shouldn't want a nicer, more reliable car. It doesn't mean if you're living in a shack, you shouldn't want a nicer house. It doesn't mean that you only get your clothes secondhand. None of all this is taken out of uh, context. What it means is you don't want what your neighbor has, who's a warmonger, a covetous, an adulterer. That's the context. God will judge those things, and we're not to want what they have. Okay, but why? How do we have this insurance that we don't have to want what they have? The last part of this verse, I, that's Jesus, will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If we really believe that, we wouldn't be stressing out 
who's going to take care of us. We wouldn't be stressing out where are we going to live. We wouldn't be stretching, stressing out how am I going to pay for my car? How, how am I going to pay for medicine? How am I going to pay for medical bills? We wouldn't be stressed out. And we wouldn't have condemnation come upon us because we are sick when we get sick. You know, well, why do you need to spend so much money on medication? Just get healed. Aren't you a Christian? Hey, dude, I'm doing it. I'm believing it, okay? But until you're there, are you taking medication? Um, you know, if it wasn't for a lot of doctors, there'd be a lot of dead Christians. Okay, so this is the context, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Now, this phrase... I will never leave you or forsake you or forsake you, was used 58 times. Exactly 57, but 58 with some slight variations to address many different situations. And appears all of them involve abandonment. The thought that God could ever abandon us is a dreadful thought which I think many of us have entered into. Now, if you look at this word forsake, I, you see I put an asterisk alongside it. That's so that you can come up with forsaken or uh, any type of, uh, uh, of ending. Uh, and here I got it listed. See, it says 58 times. But um, you see all these in the Old Testament? You see them in the New Testament. They're all here. You could come back in your leisure and look at them. And of all, every one of these, every single one of these I looked at, none of them, not one of them, is God forsaking his inheritance. Not one of them. And we could we can look at, or we're going to look, is in... in um, Matthew and Mark, both of them have the account of Jesus on the cross saying, uh, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, my God, my God. And then we'll look at Psalms 22 for that saying. And we're going to spend most of this time on those two verses because that's what is probably the biggest in the body of Christ, the biggest teaching in the body of Christ. Now, there's a church that we went to, and the pastor of that church, the lead, the senior pastor, and I were very close, and he used to always say, which he was taught in seminary, was, if God would do it to Jesus, he'll do it to you. If God would punish Jesus, he would punish you. If God would crucify his own son, he would do it to you. Uh, you know, that's a real bad teaching. It is. Because Jesus paid the price. Why would God ever do anything to me? That God would have to be a terrible, terrible, cruel God to make me pay for something Christ already paid for. Okay? I regress. However, in all these references, which apply to God's and man's relationship, there is not one that suggests God would forsake his inheritance. So why do we doubt God in this matter? Now, like you said, when you're going to get in these words forsake, I showed you 58 times, a lot of them have nothing to do with God. They have to do with man, a man uh, forsaking a situation. Uh, but in the references out of their words, God and man, not one of them, not one place did I tell them where God would forsake his inheritance. And that begs the question, why do we believe it? Why do we think that? Why do we doubt God in this matter? Have you ever not prayed, God, where are you? When you're, ha when you're having a situation. Well, the fact that you're praying to God means you believe in God. You haven't lost faith in God. But you just don't see him working 
Now, he could be working, and you could realize he's working behind the scenes. But that's not what you see. You have that doubt. That doubt comes in you. Where are you, God? Are you really here? Have I, have I been deceived all of this time? Is it really the way? Can I really claim the scriptures? Can I really claim the promises? Now, I have heard many preach that if God forsook Jesus, then he would forsake you if you sinned. Thus, you need to come to him, begging him, or begging for his forgiveness, hoping that he might grant you repentance and escape the trap you find yourself in. Now, this is out there. I mean, if you go to um, Pentecostal churches, which we're kind of affiliated with in some ways. Uh, one of the big things is coming to the altar. Confess your sins and repent. You had to sin. Uh, you know, you're on, the way to, on the way to church, you probably sinned. Arguing with your kids, yelling at your kids to get in the car. Doing something. Come to the altar. Beg God for forgiveness. Because if you die with one unconfessed sin you will not go to heaven. That's just a terrible way to live. And we just hope that God perhaps would grant us repentance. Now, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 tells us that we're to pray to God. When we're praying for other people, we're to turn people over uh, and pray that God would grant them repentance. This is what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. That oppose themselves. Most people say that oppose you but oppose themselves if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And, so in addition to, we preach that God would grant them repentance, and in addition to uh, God granting them repentance, that they may overcome themselves out of the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. To do who say will. overcome? Recover. Thank you, brother. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him to do his will. Now, this is the will of the devil. Many people have been taken captive by the devil. They've engaged in a trap to do the will of the devil. Many Christians and our traps. Do you really know it? Knowingly fall into a trap? It's usually deception. It usually doesn't look like it's going to hurt you. You usually think you could get away with it, you know, even from what we think of a mouse traps. M mouse, m mice can learn that traps will kill them through watching other mice, and they can learn different ways of getting the cheese off or whatever you have it on. But the most effective traps are those that you don't even realize are there. You don't know they're a trap. You just stumble upon it. You get enticed. You get enticed by the devil. And then you get, get taken captive. Now, if you're ca captive in a trap, how do you get out of the trap? Well, the New King James uh, addresses this. Let me see if my remembrance. And that they come to their senses and might escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. How do you say it? They come to the, your senses. So when it's here, and that they may recover themselves, that's what this is saying. How do you recover yourself? You come to your senses. 
Now, what could something be that you know a person that you think is a Christian, and for all intents and purposes, let's, 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 let's just say they are, they're betrothed, and they fall into a trap that the devil is set by him to do his will, how could they come out by coming to their senses? So you talk to them. What you're doing is not right. You think you could get away with it, but the end result will be destruction. And you try to counsel them, not argue against them, but you try to show in Scripture and you try to let the Holy Spirit convict them if they're not a believer and if they are a believer you just have them submit to God and it'll be hard and you pray God that God would grant them repentance because again these are these are believers you can't argue with them the Holy Spirit's not going to convict them of sin because they're not they're not of the world they're, if they're already in Christ, but they've been taken captive by him to do his will. We have found ourselves, I don't want to say hopelessly, because God says you can pray to get out of it, but the church, the body of Christ, has found itself in a great deception, in a great trap to do his will, and the biggest trap that is, is false teaching. That God will leave you. God will forsake you. He won't be there in your time. You can follow him, at, you know, for the best years of your life, for 20 or 30, 40 years. And when you become old, when you become unused, when nobody wants you, you're like, throw away. God's not there for you. Well, that's just a false teaching. God will be there for you greater. I think that every believer should have a, without putting one penny in retirement, should have a better life in retirement than they had while they're working. That's what I'm believing for. I personally believe that every person that puts money willfully in retirement, instead of taking that money and using it to promote the gospel, that money will cry out against them. It will be an accusation against them. And God says, well, what did you do with my resources? What did you do? The beam of seed of Christ? Christians will be judged for everything they do. It's not whether they're going to heaven or not, but rewards they get. You're going to be judged. Well, what if they do that other than they just have that access that they can put into savings? What? For the future. Can you say the very first beginning part of that? I said, what if they do give a lot of their money away, yeah. I mean, to all kinds of ministries, and they have an abundance, mm -hmm. and they're putting it away for their future? Well, you know, there might be those people out there, I don't know of any, um, that have so much, they, they, they don't know who and how to give it away, so they got to do something with it. I mean, if you got that much money, and until you figure out what to do, put it in a bank. Do you have a bank account? I have a savings account. But it's not saving to save for my future. It's saving because I'm going to go this place in two months, this place in six months. I'm going to pay my mortgage. i got to pay. I don't have a car payment anymore, but those of you that have car payments, you put it in your bank account so you can have a car payment. So I'm not saying you can't have money saved up. I'm saying if you're saving up money, if your heart is saving up money so you have a retirement, instead of giving to those in need, your heart is wrong. I'm not saying if you're giving, 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 and you have an abundance because you can't help give God, that it's wrong to put your money in the, the account. I'm saying if you, like James says, I think it's the book of James, isn't it? That says if you see your brother in need and you say, uh, you know, Hey, be well, be fed, go in peace, God be with you, that your faith is dead. Because faith without works is dead. Don't be praying for the guy that needs money. Give him money. You know? Don't be saying he'll be well. Give him money. If he needs money, give him money is what James is saying. But if you're not in that position, which I believe, that the 
harvest will overrun the planters. I believe when you start sowing and sowing and giving seeds that eventually you'll get so much money, you just don't know who to give it to. And you don't know where to use it. And you don't know where to do it. And you don't want to be casting your pearls before swine. You just don't want to be giving out to any and everybody that says they're doing good because they're really not. A lot of them are not. They're just there stealing your money and using the gospel, uh, using religion as a means to doing it. Even though I know better than the fall for that lie, it has been embedded in my mind so much that I entertain this thought occasionally. What lie? That God will forsake me. Okay. Then I have to fast and pray to get rid of this unbelief which hinders every aspect of my Christian life. I'm telling you, when I start thinking that God will not be there for me, it affects every aspect of my life. Well, why am I working on this job? God, you told me to come work at this job. There's no benefits. There's this, that. Why am I doing that? I must have heard wrong. My wife and I, when we prayed, I must have heard wrong. We didn't hear from you right. If we can't hear from you right on this, how can we be assured of anything? Wow, if I can't trust you for that, can I trust you to go to heaven? <laughs> you know, if I can't trust you for this, can I trust you that you're going to raise me from the dead? You know, the rapture, right? It affects every aspect of our life. And the only way I can get rid of this is fasting and praying. Now, one example. A couple of weeks ago, I was feeling like a failure because someone I was ministering to had stumbled. I began to doubt that God could use me to disciple people enough that they would be free from their captivity, to reconcile the lost to God, and to heal the sick, etc., so I prayed for a rhema word of God in hopes that I might be encouraged. Now, some of you don't know what a rhema word. My wife, when she was proofreading, she goes on saying, well, what's a rhema word for God? And sometimes we get into this Christianese and we don't realize that people don't work. So here's the definition of a rhema word. Uh, you can look it up, but the Greek under Strong's categorizes it G for Greek, 4487. And you could look on it here, and you can see this is Rhema, how it's pronounced, and the basically all the definition of it. You could look that up later at your own time. I'm just showing it to you. But I'll tell you basically what it is, is a word from God. It's something God spoke. If my brother is talking to me and he speaks to me personally face to face, it's a rhema word. He spoke it to me face to face. But if he told her to tell me something, it's not a rhema word from God. It could be the written word, the recorded word. It could be the logos word that he said that she recorded and gave to me accurately. Not with any error. 100% accurate. That's why we have the Logos Word of God and the Rhema Word of God. Well, we need a Rhema Word of God. A personal word from God. God being faithful brought to my remembrance a vision I had was given around the age of 16. Now, that's when I became born again. That's when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's when, um, you know, my life changed. Now, this profound vision showed me that Christ would never leave me or forsake me. Jesus then proclaimed he hasn't or at, nor ever will change his mind in this matter. I didn't write this in my notes because it would be too long, but I'll take a little time to, sh to share Many of you might have remembered this, many of you didn't. But, again, as I'm in this young, immature age, 
of Christianity, um, being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, being taught by great, by really good teachers, uh, being in a move of the Holy Spirit that seems everywhere around we were going and having really great teachings at any church we went to. There was all kinds of traveling evangelists. And it just was a wonderful time in the 70s of the South Point. Uh, anyway, I had this vision that I was up on a cliff, on a rock, and those of us that remember Sedona, remember Page, those sandstone. So you could have, it was kind of like a sandstone area, kind of those that you don't know that, what Petra looks like, kind of a sandstone area. Um, and there was a cleft in the rock, you know, uh, not a crack so much, but you would call it a cleft still, a it, almost like a cave where a chunk of, a, of the cliff fell off, like we've seen in Sedona and stuff, like where Indian dwellings and stuff they built in where the rock has actually fallen off of the cliff face. Now there's like a hole in the rock, right? You understand what I'm saying? So we're up there, and there's pretty high cliff up there. And in this cleft of the rock, and there's two boulders there, and behind the two boulders, which were towards the edge, uh, to the left, and then to the right, there's free access, I was standing there along with two men. Now these two men were my mentors. They were teaching me the ways of God. They were teaching me how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were teaching me that Satan was going to come and try to attack me, destroy me, steal the words, steal the blessings, steal the, steal the gifts away from me. And as they were, right when they were teaching me this, all these black birds, let's, let's call them crows, ravens, whatever, but they were big black birds come flying to me. And they were nose di uh, bomb dive bombing me, right? Coming in and hit me, and hit me. And they were sitting there fighting them off. And these mentors were there. They were fighting off these birds. And then here I see Jesus in the air, floating in the air off this cliff. And he beckoned me to come to get away from these birds. Step off the cliff. And of course, it was kind of like the whole Peter stepping in the water issue type of thing. So if I didn't ask to go, like Peter did, I was commanded by Jesus, or, or offered by Jesus to come. So I did. I stepped out and I walked out to Jesus. And I didn't doubt. I didn't think. I didn't lose interest. I didn't, nothing negative. I walked out to Jesus, and we just both walked downstairs. Down the end. Kind of fast, kind of like falling, but not falling, you know. Uh, but I realized I couldn't, I couldn't go up. And I realized I couldn't stop. I was, or without stairs, I was going down. And Jesus was there holding my hand the entire time and we got to the bottom. In the dream, in the vision. All my life, all my Christian life was like, what does this mean, God? Am I going to fail? Am I going to fall? And you're going to be there and help me? Are you going to take me out and you're going to be there? Uh, I'm going to lose you. The birds are going to come. I'm going to doubt you. I'm not going to be able to walk on water like Peter did, you know. The example. Uh, I've always been doing it. And God showed me before many years and he reminded me of this a couple of weeks that he'll never forsake me. No matter what you're going, if you're in a high ministry, in a high combat zone, or you're just life going easy, he'll never leave you or forsake you. If you want for money, he'll never leave you or forsake you. If you got money coming in faster than you spend, he'll never leave you or forsake you. And he'll never change his mind. And never means never means never. Psalm 68, I said God's faithful, right? No, we, we, oh, 
Okay, let me just go to Psalm 68, chapter 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Selah. Blessed the Lord daily loads us. I'm leaving out the parenthesis words, the added words. The God of our salvation. God loads us daily with blessings. Loads us. You know, does that mean give up, gives us? Usually a load implies heavy, you know, something you got to carry. And it's usually more than for yourself. If you're carrying a load, it's usually more for yourself. Daily. Have you guys right here in this room that I'm talking to, those out on the internet that will watch this, have you received the load that God has given you, not could given you, not will give you in our need, but the Bible says he loads us daily. Have we used those benefits? You know, I was at the store yesterday, I bought some uh, uh, lamp oil, and uh, there was a lady Salvation Army doing the bill, and it was cold. I mean, that poor girl was shivering outside, it rained, you know, that cold, wet, damp. So I get up there at Salvation Army, put some money in, and I guess, well, are you hungry? Can I get you anything? There's nothing hot. They don't have anything hot in here. Can I get you? And it's like, well, I said, yeah, I'd like some, a cookie, <laughs> some milk to drink it. So I went in and bought these cookies. Well. I didn't want to go all the way down the line, so I seen the little uh, things in the middle, the gourmet cookie section. I looked, oh, these that look good. I go up there, it's a two ninety seven. dollars Okay, that's good, and I bought a thing of chocolate milk. I get up there, and how much did I say they were? 11 bucks or 9 bucks, 10 yeah. bucks? For these cookies, the gourmet cookies. <coughs> So I go out there and it's like I get I, her, her milk and cookies with tax was like twelve thirteen dollars right and I felt get I felt bad that I gave her I spent more money on her cookies than I put in the salvation money bucket <laughs> I really felt bad but you know we're loaded with benefits to give to other people and it doesn't mean we always have to give it to somebody like some ministry some some sal the salvation army or some other group it might be your neighbor it might be your daughter it might be somebody that is working for the lord okay that is doing it for the lord but god may be giving you money to go do something to bless somebody else with. Second Timothy chapter two verse thirteen. If we believe not, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So this is talking about and losing your faith, basically. You, 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 you're so full of unbelief that you would walk away if it's possible. But right here it says, he's sitting there saying, it's basically impossible because Christ cannot deny himself. Where's Christ at? It's getting warm, isn't it? You want to try, I turned the heater on. You want, you want to turn the heater off for me? So we don't fall asleep, Norm. I just turn it, just turn it off. We got the fireplace going. I'm getting quite warm. But this is basically saying Christ is inside. You can deny God all you want. You can be having a problem all you want, but God's not going to deny Himself. You're not going to lose faith. You're not going to get rid of that faith. You might have to get rid of that unbelief, but you're not going to have to get rid of that faith. You get rid of that unbelief, boom, you're right back in, full board, 100% loaded, ready to go, because you don't have to acquire more faith. 
You don't have to acquire more blessings. You only have to get rid of what's keeping you from receiving the blessing that God did. This is a whole different mindset. God, you can't walk away from God unless you completely forsake him, be immature, and you die. Because God is faithful. When you have these stumblings, like I talked about, this man I'm, it, I'm ministering to, it, man, he really affected me. He stumbled. Yet, if he has Christ in him, it can't last. He'll be back. He'll be healed. He'll be prolonged. He'll, he'll go through. Yeah, is it this yo-yo? But the word says, if ye believe not, he that abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So even if you fought, stumble, you lost faith in Christ, lost faith in your Christian worship, in your Christian walk, and you're not dead, you haven't forsaken God. He's still in there. And God cannot deny himself. He can't. I hope that is a, a blessing to some other people. God cannot deny himself. God will never forsake you. How long is for never? Never. How long? Ever. Forever and ever. He'll never forsake you. Now, as minuscule as this sounds, you know, my my uh, my vision and that rhema word wasn't some, like some people wearing a word from God. It's like this great download of prophecy. What's going to happen? What's he going to do with my life? Where am I going to go? It wasn't that. It was he would never leave me or forsake me. Now, as minuscule as that sounds, it was what I needed to hear from God, from the mouth of God. Remember, the rhema word from God. You could read the Bible. And this is the logos word of God. And you, it could turn into a rhema word of God. You could have a personal experience from reading the Bible. But how many people have read the Bible and not followed Christ? How many people have had the Word of God, the Logos Word of God, preached to them and not been filled with faith? That's why it says in Romans 10, 17, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That Word is rhema. You have to have a personal Word from God. I don't know, uh, I haven't found anywhere in the Bible of anyone that has had a personal word from God that didn't follow God. Well, how about Judas of Iscariot? Well, Judas of Iscariot was a wheat and a tear. Judas of Iscariot was a swine. Judas of Iscariot was predestined. That's why God tells us don't cast her pearls before swine. Okay? So let me put the qualifier. I've never met somebody whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life that got a rhema word from God that didn't, it didn't change their life. It didn't take them out of despair and put them up. It didn't make them where they could not face any challenge. All odds, everything's against them, and they say, but my God. I got diabetes, but my God, you're going to cut, kill me. You're going to cut my kid's head off if I don't denounce God. But I got a ream of word from God. He'll never leave me or forsake me. I'm not discrediting hearing God's word. The written word, the logos word, can change your mind. But faith only comes from the spoken word, rhema, of God, from God himself. So let's look at that. Logos, the written word. I held up the Bible. It's the written word. It is the word of God. Uh, how about John, chapter 1, verse, verse 1. Uh, the word of God. Jesus is the word. That's Logos. Here it is. You can read it. 
Um, it is basically the same thing as Rhema. Step, it could be recorded. It could be spoken and not personal face to face. Did Moses tell the Israelites the word of God? Yeah. Yes. That was a logos if you were read it in the Greek. Of course it was written in Hebrew. But that would be a logos, word of God. The accurate representation of what exactly, word for word, God, tell everything that God said, Moses relayed it to the people without error. That was a logos word of God. But what did Moses get? He got a rhema word from God. God said that I speak to Moses face to face. I speak to you, Miriam and Arian, in dreams and visions. But Moses, I speak face to face. I give Moses a rhema word. That's why Moses never doubted. That's why Moses, when it come to the point, didn't doubt God was there. Because he had a rhema word. But Aaron never appeared to have a rhema word from God. He only got a logos word from God. He only, and, and, and was willing to fall and was blessed. But that's why, remember, Aaron made the calf, right? To worship the, the gods of Egypt, right? Now let's get back to, uh, I already, we already looked at this, you could click on it, uh, I'll just show you that uh, Logos Word is basically just said a little bit different, but basically the same thing as Rhema, it's just one personal first-hand account, the other is second-hand account, okay, uh, in, in, uh, in court you call it hearsay, okay, so, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. This is what's cr crucial. We all know that. What? Faith cometh by hearing, but hearing by the word of God. See what that word is right there? Rhema. How do you get faith? Not by the Logos word of God, but by the Rhema word of God. When God tells you he loves you, when God tells you he will never leave you or forsake you, you can step up, get up in the morning and do the same stupid, terrible, mundane things. Have your same circumstances of friends or family caught up in the traps of the devil. And you can have that confidence that God is there and he loves you. And he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He won't leave you as an orphan. Again, at this Bible study, we were talking with the kid, guys. I said, we need to pray for a rhema word from God. You want to be free of drugs? Get a rhema word from God. Don't believe what I tell you about God. Don't look at it. Analyze it agree with it that what I tell you is true right out of the Bible that I am in representing the word of God correctly to you you need a rhema word of God this means somehow whether hearing a preacher proclaim the recorded word of God or God speaking to you it must be from God himself or you will not be filled with faith. Therefore, I no longer believe, but I know God will never leave, never forsake me. And furthermore, he didn't forsake Jesus, as Psalms 22, 19 through 21 clearly proclaim. Now, this is where I'm spending a way a little too much time. Um, but this is where we get the big things of, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That God, God is a holy and just God, and he can't look upon sin. And he had to turn his back upon Jesus. All these are false teachings. 
Psalms 22, verse 19 through 21. But he, not though far from me, O Lord, O my strength, hasten thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of lions, for thou hast heard me from the horn of the unicorn. Okay, so, man, I don't want to go read that in the New King James. I like it in the Old King James, but it was wordy. It's hard to do it. It clearly, clearly proclaims that whoever is writing this, that God would not forsake them. He would deliver them from the horn of the unicorn. So looking closely at Jesus' statement on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which we see in Matthew 7, 27, 46, and Mark 15, 34. Jesus is um, a statement, that's a question. Is this Jesus proclaiming he was forsaken of God, or was it something else? So is this Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is this Jesus proclaiming he was forsaken from God, or was it something else? I have already mentioned in all references of the word forsaken, which is down here again, I cut and paste it again, 58 times, there is none indicating God would ever forsake any of his sons, whether adopted or begotten. Why is that so important? Because Jesus is the only begotten son of God and we are adopted sons of God John chapter 3 verse 16 says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life so Jesus clearly being God being the word being the logos but he is the only begotten uh, my mother, I did not come from the Holy Spirit and impregnating mom. Dad and mom did that, okay? But for me, Romans 8, verses 14 through 15 says, As for many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. So am I led by the Spirit of God? Yes. Therefore, I'm a son of God. But how do I become a son of God? For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So I'm an adopted son of God, but am I a son of God? So he'll never leave me or forsake me, nor did he ever leave or forsake his only begotten son. So just these scriptures right here and what's in the Psalms 22 already proves that it's impossible for God to have forsaken Jesus. Just reading the same Psalms 22 that people will use to claim that he was. Okay, so stringing the pearls is a phrase used to describe how some teachers would use the first and the last part of a passage to invoke the major point of the passage. This causes the pupil to remember the reference, yet still have to look it up for the full meaning. By the way, there are many books out there that describe this method well, one of which is Sitting at the Face Feet of Rabbi Jesus by Ann Spangler and Louis Taberg. Taberg? T-V-E-R-B-E-R-G. I put a reference if you want to buy the book up there. I'm not going to go there. But this is called Stringing the Pearls. So if you're teaching somebody and you're trying to get the point about across something, you'll just say the kind of major emphasis. 
and you'll give the beginning of where that emphasis is and the end, and you let them fill in the blank. They have to go. Uh, remember, we didn't have chapter and verses back then. So when Jesus was on the cross, his disciples were, were there watching. Now, many people say that no one was there watching Jesus but Mary. No, all the disciples, it says the disciples were watching. Okay, they were far off, but they were watching. Some, if not all, were disillusioned. That's the cap on it. I think so. Uh, seeing their Messiah defeated, lying, dying on the cross, never to lead them into freedom from the tyranny of the Romans. Yet Jesus did tell them that the Christ would have to suffer, die, and be raised from the dead on the third day. So you got these disciples that they already acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah. Remember God asked Peter, well, who, who do you say I am? You know, who do they say I am? Some say Elijah the prophet, some, and he says, well, who do you say I am? And basically, Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the promised one. Okay, so they already believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But here your Messiah, your deliverer, is dying on a cross. All your hopes are gone. What did they do? Peter denied him twice before the, the three times before the cro crew twice. What did they do right after Jesus was crucified? It says they went and hid themselves for fear of the Jews. See, they thought, hey, dude, we were, fo we were following this guy who's going to overtake the government. He was going to set the Israel, the nation Israel, free from the tyranny of Roman occupation and actually rule over Rome. They wanted to sit one on his right hand and one on his left hand. We're told that the disciples wanted to sit there. So they're like, whoa. We, watch, watch his head. I see it. That's what I'm They're sitting that. there like, whoa, what? we have been deceived upon all deception. We followed this guy. We put everything in and he died. Luke chapter 24, verse 19 through 21. Get rid of some of these. And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and words before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since this, these things were done. See, they were believing that this guy, prophet mighty indeed, was going to redeem all of Israel, but he didn't. They were already full of unbelief. Now again, I told you that Jesus explained to them that he would have to die, that he would have to suffer, but they didn't get it. They didn't understand. Matt Chapter 16, verse 21. From, from that, that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So Jesus told them that this was going to happen. It shouldn't have been any surprise. Mark 8, 31 through 23. I think I said Mark up there. That was my previous statement was Matthew 16. 
verse 21. Now we're in Mark 8, verse 31 through 32. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders uh, and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days be raised again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now in Luke 24 verses 44 and 45. And he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which was written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. Then open their understandings, that they might understand the scriptures. They needed a rhema word to understand. Jesus being faithful to his Father's will. Remember, Jesus goes to the Gethsemane right before he's getting ready to be whipped, beaten, and, and stripes in uh, Pilate's Praetorium. He prays to the Father, if it be thy will, take this cup for me. But Jesus was faithful to his Father's will, spoke to the disciples that he, they would remember what was written about him as how he would die. So again, here's these guys that are looking at him. They're thinking he's the Messiah. They're going to redeem Israel. And he has to remind them. He can see that they're getting depressed. He can see that they're losing their faith. He reminds them that, hey, i got to do this because it was written in the Psalms. Furthermore, reminding them that all that is written by the inspiration of God must be fulfilled. Okay, so first, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, and then back at Luke 24. But 2 Timothy, Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Back to Luke 24.44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I have spoken to you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the book of Psalms concerning me. So they didn't, Jesus couldn't do that deliverance. He couldn't do that yet because he had to fulfill what was written to him in the Psalms. Now Psalms 22 verses 1 and 2 starts with a cry from the psalmist, which most of us agree is David, asking God why God has forsaken him in his time of need, even though he cried out to him both day and in the night time, but he would not answer him. Now did Jesus... Was Jesus crying out to God in the day and the night time and God not answering him? When did this says that when Jesus took on the sins of the world that God couldn't look upon sin and turn his back and wouldn't do it? Well, right here in Psalms 22 where it says that verse, it says the guy that said that cried out to God in the day and in the nighttime seasons. Okay, read that. Psalms 22. This is the one that people come and use as it saying that God forsook Jesus. And it says, to the chief musician of Psalm blah, 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 David, starting, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my gro groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night seasons, and am not silent. This does not feel, fit the scenario of Jesus. Jesus was on the cross. Take, took the sins of the world upon him. 
But God didn't forsake them. As a matter of fact, a side point, I know I'm getting late, but I don't want to carry this on until next week, if that's okay. Is that okay with you guys? Do we need to take a break to go to the bathroom? Because I really want to finish this. I'm, I, because it's hugely important. Did Cain, when he killed Abel, if we have to say sin is sin, would we say that was a sin? When Cain killed Abel? Would we say that was bad? Like one of the big sins? Yet God comes and talks to Cain personally. One on one. Face to face. And God protects Cain. God puts a mark on Cain. So that other people wouldn't kill Cain. So God in the Old Testament never ever had one instance of of any time dealing with people that sinned. Not one time. This was David's accusation against God, not Jesus's. However, God does answer David and foretells how he will deliver him from his enemies in the following verses, 6 through 21 of the same chapter, chapter 22. Starting at verse 6, ending at verse 21. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lips. They shake their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him, him deliver him, seeing he delighted in but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was out upon my mother's breath. I was cast unto upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bowls have compassed me, strong bowls of Bashaw have beset me around. They gasp at their mouth. They gasp upon me with their mouths as ravening and ro roaring lions. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melts in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shed. My tongue clings to my jaws as though brought me to the dust of death. For the dogs have compassion, compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and feet. I, that I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cat laugh, lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Hasten to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns and the unicorn. That sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus is telling David, hey, you're going to get delivered, and this is how I'm going to do it. And Jesus says, even in this, that God will hear him and never forsake him. That God the Father will deliver him. Not, not forsake him, not turn his back on him. Telling him that God has hidden his face from them, but has made a way of escape for all the seed of Jacob. By reminding them the seed of Jacob to seek the Lord and their heart will live forever. Finally, David foretells that the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will tell the account of the crucifixion to all the world through all generations that God has finished his work of reconciliation. So Tom, 
let's go back to Psalms 22, verse 31. I know this is where he gets back to. I will declare in the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee, yea, that, that fear the Lord. Praise him, all ye seed of Jacob. Glorify him, fear him, all ye seed of Israel. For he hath not despised or abhorred the afflictions of the afflicted, neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember remember and turn unto the Lord and all the kindreds of nations shall worship before thee for the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among nations and all they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship and all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him and none can keep alive his soul a seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for generations. They shall come and declare his righteousness unto the people that shall be born that he has done this. See the seed of Jacob. Who's the seed of Jacob? Boop, boop. Who's the seed of Abraham? Boop, boop. We will declare... That Jesus, God has done this. That God has put Jesus as our Messiah. He's our deliverer. Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew, one which is outwardly, neither is, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but God. So who's a, who's a Jew? Christians. What if you're Polynesian Christian? You're a Jew. What if you're Mongolian Christian? You're a Jew. Who is a Jew? Not one that was circumcised outwardly, but one circumcised inwardly. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Paul says, Christ is a seed, and we are in Christ, and we will be proclaiming what God has done through Jesus, the Messiah, as his the Lamb of God, as his Redeemer. God never forsook Jesus. It never says he forsook Jesus. Revelation 3, verse 9. Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved God. Thee. So there's going to be those that say they're Jews and they're not. Only one that's a Jew is the one that God has loved. The seed of, that are of the seed of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now remember in Psalms, it said, 22, it says those that diligently seek him, those that seek him, their hearts will live forever. That when Jesus dies on the cross, that the seed of Jacob, seed of Abraham's, seed of Isaac, but the seed of Jacob it specifically says it will go out and proclaim this to all nations and all generation that God had done this. 
Psalms 22 that he's done this to all generation, that God has finished his work of reconciliation. Remember, Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he says it's finished. String in the pearls. The first part of the thought, major thought process of Psalms 22, the last part, because there is no chapter, no verse, no numerization. Okay? Psalms 22, verse 31, that's what. So, and they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto the people that shall be born, that he hath done this. So the seed of Jacob will come and declare, will go out to all the world, will preach the, the gospel of reconciliation, will be giving the same anointing that Jesus had, the spirit of reconciliation, to all the world, that God has done this. You know, when we look that up, that God hath done, that's finished. God finished his work. Now, what have we got? We got the same anointing Christ has. To wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. When studying the word, we see Jesus was not forsaken by God, but was encouraging the disciples by reminding them of the prophetic word recorded in Psalms 22. Remember, there was no numerical cataloging of scripture back then to help locate specific passages. Thus, Jesus continues to use his technique of stringing the pearls by state starting with the first phrase, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And ending with the last, that he, hath done. The disciples were reminded that this is all part of the plan. Seeing Jesus up on the cross, Jesus speaks to them, having already told them that he has to do this. But he's reminding them. Now apparently it still didn't sink in. Because they, they fled and they were running, they were hiding. But that's what Jesus is doing. So concluding, you are loved of God with the same measure that Christ is loved of God. I'm going to get to that scripture. But if you have this concept that God will forsake Jesus, it's so easy to open it up that, well, if God forsake Jesus, he'll forsake me if I sin. God's so holy, he can't look upon sin. God couldn't look upon Jesus because he was uh, took all the sins of the world. Well, that opens a whole other can of worm. If I had times, I would have explained a bit. How long could God not look upon him? You know? We know he was in the grave three days. Three days took care of all the sins. It was enough punishment for all the sins of the whole world. Concluding, you are loved by God with the same measure that Christ is loved by God. Remember, as Christ is, so are you in this world. 1 John 4, 17. Now, if you read this in context, I know I preach, you know, like, if you got a cold, does Jesus have a cold? No, as Christ is, so are you in this world. You don't have a cold. I get that. I'm not against that. Teaching. I use it. I adhere to it. But this passage, the context is it is love. The context is that you're loved as much as Christ is. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. 
So if you read the verses previous to verse 17 of chapter 4, we see that he's talking about love. So how are we? We're loved as Jesus is. You know, if I am loved the same amount that God loves his only begotten son, I have no shame. I'm an adopted child, but God loves me exactly as much as he loves his only begotten son. That's powerful, guys. God will never leave you or forsake you. I don't care what great teacher that we admire says that he does it. It is not true. It causes unbelief and it's causing destruction in this world and is caught with they've been trapped by Satan in a trap to do his will. And that will is to keep the body of Christ weak, to keep the body of Christ fallen. Well, maybe God doesn't love me enough to heal me. He loves you because you pray more. He loves you because you fast more. He loves you because you're serving God, but he doesn't love me. If he loved me, I wouldn't be sick. If so loved of God, how could he ever leave you orphans without a father to protect, provide, and fellowship with? I didn't put a reference on here, but you all know what God says he won't leave you orphans. Jesus says he won't leave you orphans. Concluding here, God will never leave you. God will never be mad at you. He will never forsake you. Get that in your head. I don't care what you did. I don't care who says that's bad. I don't care if they say you're going to go to hell unless you repent and confess your sins before God. Because if you die with this unconfessed sin, you're going to hell. You're trapped. You're in a trap of the devil because God will never, ever, ever forsake you. Amen. Sorry I ran over. Um, did want to get that out. Hopefully everybody has a good day. And uh, just remember, this is true. Go through every one of these scriptures, guys. It's just not true. God will never leave you or forsake you.